Good evening and welcome to Your Uninvited, Stopping the Spread of Invasive Species Screening and Panel Discussion. Tonight's event is brought to you by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, WXXI, and WSKG Public Media Stations. I'm your host, Nancy Coddington, Director of Science Content for WSKG Public Media. We have a special event planned for you tonight, including a preview of selected segments from the newly released documentary, Uninvited, The Spread of Invasive Species. We will hear from a panel of experts from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. We also have joining us the filmmaker from Westfield Productions. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you are tuning in from. We have participants from all over the country and the world attending our events, and we love to know where you're tuning in from. So please introduce yourself. I wanna also encourage you to ask questions of our guest panelists tonight throughout the talk. We are streaming on New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Facebook, WSKG's YouTube, and we are on Zoom this evening, and we have chat moderators waiting for your questions. At this time, I would like to introduce the State Forester of New York, Rob Davies. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Nancy. It's happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. And Rob, can you welcome our guests? Sure. Um, well, as you said, I, I, I'm Rob Davies. I, I am the state forester for New York uh, and DEC's director of lands and forests. Uh, that's the uh, division that actually houses the Bureau of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health that um, promoted and developed this documentary that we're here to talk about tonight. So I first just want to thank WSKG and WXXI for hosting this event uh, to review some clips from the new documentary, Uninvited, which showcases New York's diverse and abundant natural resources and the risk those resources face from invasive species and the comprehensive program and responses we've developed to address those risks. The documentary uh, highlights the many partners DEC's invasive species program works with and relies on across New York State. Partners like our sister state agency, the Department of Agricultural and Markets, who's on the panel tonight, the eight Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, or PRISMS, the New York Natural Heritage Program, and the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. We're all major players in the development of this documentary that you'll see tonight. Something DEC and all our partners realize is none of us can meet the challenges presented by invasive plants, pests, and diseases alone. It takes an all hands on deck approach that very much includes the public at large. It's for that reason, DEC's Division of Lands and Forests started pre-pandemic to develop the uninvited documentary, a documentary to help inform and educate the public about the problems invasive species pose to New York's ecosystems, all the work being done by a myriad of organizations, individuals, and volunteers to fight these problems, the science and tools being employed in this fight, and most importantly, to encourage the public to get involved. Because even with all the ongoing efforts by New York State, DEC, and its partners, we can't be everywhere. We need as many boots and eyes on the ground that we can get, and we need the public to help us. One of our primary goals and sayings in the Invasive Species Program is early detection and rapid response. The sooner we find a new outbreak or infestation, the quicker we can attack it and hopefully eradicate or control it. The longer an infestation festers without our knowledge, the bigger the problem becomes to fight. Our best weapon for early detections and waging a successful fight against the spread of invasive species and thereby protecting New York State's forests farms, parks, waters, and its people is an informed, involved, and inspired public. We hope that this uninvited documentary will inspire the audience tonight and all those that watch the documentary to report and help stop the spread of invasive plants, pests, and diseases in their yards, their local parks, 
or their favorite outdoor recreation spot. Again, thank you for inviting us tonight. We hope everyone enjoys the clips and watches the full documentary on DEC's YouTube page. Thank you very much and back to you, Nancy. Thank you, thank you, Rob Davies. We will preview three stories from the documentary, Uninvited, the Spread of Invasive Species, with our panelists' perspective on each segment. And then we will also take questions about the film for our panelists to answer during that time frame. And then we'll also come back and answer questions near the end of the show at the top of the hour. I would like to introduce our panelists tonight. Steve Powers is director and producer for Westfield Production Company. Steve is an award-winning director and co-founder of Westfield Films. He has been making movies with and directing with his directing partner and brother, Jim Powers, since they were kids growing up in Avril Park, New York. Welcome, Steve. Hi there. Jessica Cancellari is a research scientist with the DEC Forest Health Program in the Bureau of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Jessica received her bachelor's in science in wildlife science from SUNY ESF and her master's in entomology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Welcome, Jessica. Chris Logue is the state planet plant regulatory official with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Chris has been in this role since 2014. Prior to this, he worked for Cornell Cooperative Extension for over 20 years. He has worked in the greenhouse and nursery and landscape sectors in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me tonight. So these are our panelists who we will be asking questions of in just a few minutes. One of the most prominent emerging invasive species in New York State is the spotted lanternfly. It has taken over Pennsylvania and New Jersey and has finally found its way to New York City, Ithaca, Broome County, and the Hudson Valley. In this segment that we're going to watch, we will hear from Pennsylvania vineyard owner Richard Blair about the dangers that the spotted lanternfly poses to New York wineries and apple orchards. We bought this site in 2007 and opened a winery here in 2010. So, best grape for this area is probably Cabernet Franc and Chardonnay, but uh, a lot of other things do fairly well or, or very well most years. It's one of those things where it's you never knew how popular you were until you owned a vineyard. And First thing you notice, there's no lantern flies here. Uh, there's one right there, so we got one, but he's not going to be living too long. Every plant has has a few on them. Some have more than a few, like this guy right here. Probably at the point where they stay on here for a couple weeks, and this plant's probably going to be dead. So we can see that that's a spotted lanternfly. Lanternfly is showing just how destructive it can be. They just keep moving in and moving in, and it it looks like swarms of locusts. That's how heavy they come in oh, here. Wow. So several dead lanternflies and one live one were found at a tree nursery in Deer Park. They say the bug arrived at a shipment from Pennsylvania, where the fly is most prevalent. A spotted lanternfly feeds on the sugary sap of over 70 different plant species, including grapevines. You know, they're, they're just uh. Not very nice, nice bug. Yeah, New York State has been really watching the spotted lanternfly closely as it's been moving in from more southern states. This is something that was introduced just a few years ago to North America, 
And here in New York State, we have a lot of commodities at, at stake. So agriculture is a big example. We have, you know, lots of wineries. They can go after grapevines, after tree fruits. And so those those areas can be uh, deeply impacted. It can, you know, destroy the, the crop for that season for that farmer. And so that's a, a big economic impact. There's a couple of vineyards uh, south of here that uh, lost most or all their, their grapevines. So uh, some people quit, you know. Other people are decided to buy fruit from somewhere else and <coughs> not replanting until, the, until they know what's, you know, how to take care of it. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it, it, once it, you leave the genie out of the bottle, it's pretty hard to put it back in. So, I mean, it's, if, unless you get it stopped, it's, it's going to be a problem for everybody. So. so we're looking for a spotted lanternfly, uh, particularly the egg masses. They'll lay their egg masses on just about Anything that sits outside for any period of time in a known infested area, uh, they're shiny and gray, so we can pick them up pretty easily with a camera. I'm using a zoom camera, so I can fly pretty close uh, and then zoom right in on anything that doesn't look quite right. Well, this is basically the process, is trying to keep the aircraft steady over the trailer in the breeze and you can see it moves back and forth a lot. So if there's anything really suspicious, uh, we could always bring it back and look at it on the computer before we let the truck drive away. So I was interested in some of these dark spots. So you can see I zoomed the camera in just to get a better idea of their shape and color. They didn't really match for uh, egg masses, so we can let the truck go. What? Well, the issue is, and why we're going through all this trouble, is, is, is the economic impact and the, and the impact to the state in terms of its tourism. Um, you look at what's going on in Pennsylvania and the problems that they're having, uh, we don't want to have that same issue here. So, you know, prevention is, is worthwhile. You know, if we, can, if we can educate these guys about the impacts of spotted lanternfly, get them under compliance, um, that goes a long ways in terms of preventing it and also determining where it may be. One of these truck drivers, you know, may be at their home later on and they may see spotted lanes before. So the outreach that we do to them is also, you know, critically important, not just for New York, but for other states because they're coming in from all over the place. It's time that you heard about any kind of invasive species quarantine and all that. This is it. The first time I heard about it? That's the first time ever. I'm going to give it to my boss, the pamphlet they gave me, and uh, have them keep an eye out for it. Oh, I, uh, I like my wine, so let's uh, get this under control. Getting invasive species under control is easier said than done, and it gets more difficult the longer that they are here. Being on the cusp of this invasive pest is rather sobering. I'd like to welcome the Division of Plant Industry Coordinator for New York State Ag and Markets, Chris Logue. So Chris, what is the current status of spotted lanternfly in New York State? So uh, thanks for having me, Nancy. So uh, we're we're kind of in a different time than than when some of this was filmed. Um, at the time when this was filmed, our main focus was really um, on prevention, preventing spotted lanternfly from becoming established or introduced into New York State. And, you know, the clip that you saw with the DEC and Ag and Market staff doing the truck inspections uh, was just one of those um, activities that we, you know, do early on when we're trying to assess how an invasive species uh, might come into New York and how it might establish. Uh, there was a great deal of outreach that was done. And then the other thing that I, that's very interesting about that clip is, is that that was the first time that we had used um, the UAVs uh, for this type of, of work. And so there was a big safety advantage for us uh, in using those because our inspectors didn't have to climb up on top of uh, vehicles or, or loads on trailers to assess whether there were any, any pests in there. Um, as I said, we're in a little bit of a different time now than, than when this was filmed. Uh, currently we have 
uh, populations of spotted lanternfly out in the landscape in, in uh, 13 counties uh, as we have closed out the growing season this year. Um, it's really important to keep in mind when I refer to 13 counties, however, though, that it's not that a whole county is infested, but that there is a discrete infestation in a particular county. You did mention in the introduction a couple of the uh, locations where, where we found this and documented it in the landscape. Um, Staten Island was our first find in New York State uh, in August of 2020. And that was a uh, find by um, staff with the Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation at a, a um, park uh, on Staten Island called Clay Pit Pond State Park. And from there, we actually uh, found it in a number of additional places uh, between August and October of last year, including the Ithaca uh, location that you mentioned, uh, which we actually um, did some tree removals in an effort to uh, reduce the number of egg masses in that particular location. The other thing that I'd say about the clip is, and probably one of the more sobering things and why our agency at Ag and Markets is so concerned about this, is just the impact uh, that has been observed down in Pennsylvania on, on their grape industry. Important to keep in mind, New York is number three in grape production in the country. Uh, there's been huge investment into the wine and grape industry as well as the juice industry here over the past 10 or 20 years. And uh, I think the truck driver said it really well uh, by saying he, you know, he liked his wine and he, and he wanted to protect that resource here in New York. And certainly, you know, we're committed to that. We have a lot of partners in, in this effort, um, you know, and Rob mentioned that in his introduction and certainly folks in his shop have been sh shoulder to shoulder with us all along here, but also our partners at the United States Department of Agriculture uh, plant protection and quarantine. Uh, their staff uh, have been side by side with us as well with survey. Uh, and as we develop our, our management plans going into 2022, they're an integral, integral part of that as well. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to just say a little bit about is, is um, you know, early detection is really, really important. And we put a lot of resources into early detection. Uh, we have a really great relationship with our partner agency down in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. We speak probably weekly or sometimes more frequently than that. And Pennsylvania did a fantastic job of holding this uh, infestation uh, back over the past, uh, I guess now seven years. They found it in 2014. And in reality, you know, our expectation was that we probably uh, would see it a little bit sooner than we did. Uh, this gave us a little bit more time to plan. Um, but you know, the the old saying about the best laid plans going astray, a lot of our plans really focused on um, that we anticipated that we would have a have perhaps a discrete introduction in, in one or two places in the state and be able to uh, manage and control this fairly quickly. And what we've wound up with is multiple introductions. And I think this really plays into uh, the type of, uh, the type of uh, insect that this is. Uh, it has the uh, ability to uh, develop a large population quickly. We don't have uh, a really effective trap and lure, in particular when the populations are very, very low and you have a new introduction. Uh, having a good trap and lure is really, really important. And so uh, those early detection efforts are uh, very, very challenging for this, for this particular insect. The other thing that we find very, very challenging about it and that's different about, uh, about it from the standpoint of many of the other um, insect and disease issues that we've dealt with in the past uh, through our division at Ag and Markets is that this moves on so many different uh, conveyances and on so many different commodities. And oftentimes it's moving on commodities that, that we don't have all that much experience regulating and we may not have the relationships with the industry. Um, this did not come into Pennsylvania uh, on an agricultural product. 
it came into Pennsylvania, or it is thought to have come into Pennsylvania on uh, stone that was imported uh, from uh, Europe or Asia, and that the eggs were actually laid on the slabs of stone, which are shipped on pallets, sort of on edge vertically. And so it's a very difficult cargo to inspect in the port and just very, very challenging uh, for, for uh, folks to, to get out there and survey and look for it. So this has been really, really challenging. I will say also from the standpoint of feeling as though we're very prepared, also to a certain extent humbling and certainly um, brings into focus the fact that we, we started on this journey with Spotted Lanternfly with not a lot of research behind us, I think some of the good things that have come out of this is some really fantastic research collaborations between Cornell, Penn State, um, several uh, private universities, as well as USDA and the Forest Service. So long term, the hope is, is, that a, is that a natural control can be developed for spotted lanternfly with the hopes that we'll get to a place where the population can be maintained at a, at a uh, level where we're not seeing a great deal of, of damage uh, in grapes and some of the other commodities. You did also hear the, uh, uh, in the introduction that this uh, spotted lanternfly can feed on about 70 different plants. Um, the only one where we've really seen a great deal of economic damage at this point is uh, grapes. And then the other really very interesting thing that we found about spotted lanternfly uh, so far is that it really has um, it has a preferred host uh, in uh, in the tree of heaven, Alanthus, which is an invasive plant uh, that is pretty prevalent in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and also in the southern parts of uh, New York State. As you go further north and and west in New York, it's a little bit less prevalent. But it seems as though at certain times of the year, certain points in the spotted lanternfly life cycle, the insect goes and feeds on that particular tree and it also almost acts as a sentinel tree for us so we can focus in our survey efforts. Chris, thank you so much. That is a lot of really great information. Um, we have a question. Is there information that's being widely shared uh, and communicated so that people are aware of what to do if they see one of these um, as far as how to report it or even aware that they are in the state? Sure. So we've done a great deal of outreach on this as, as uh, has the DEC and the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management and our partners at, at Cornell Cooperative Extension. So that information can be found on our agency website as well as on the DEC website, also on the New York State IPM website. And so the most important thing as far as engaging the public at this point in time is that if folks were to see this, and again, we've, we've had a couple of hard frosts, and so the adult activity has really dropped off and our reporting uh, has dropped off over the past couple of weeks. But if folks were to see these and you still might see some, some dead ones out there in the landscape or some really lethargic ones, to, on, for instance, today in Albany was a pretty warm, nice day. And if we had them in Albany, we probably would see them. Uh, on a day like today, we don't have them in Albany. I just want to be clear on that, uh, that we know of at this point. Um, but really important in particular upstate that if uh, folks were to see these, that they report them to us. There's a number of different ways they can do that. If they go onto our website, we have a GIS form that they can fill out. They can upload a picture. Uh, it'll, it'll date stamp it. It'll put the GPS coordinates on it. And uh, that's the uh, most effective and quickest way to get your report in. And I believe that link is being put into the chat for people's reference. Uh, one last question before we move on to our next segment. Uh, when is the best time to find each part of the life cycle? You know, you talked about the eggs, the larva and the adults. Um, can you walk us through that? Sure. So egg laying happens uh, happens in the fall of the year. So between probably, I want to say maybe September 10th through to through until frost, um, and the eggs uh, are laid in in masses on all types of different um, locations and materials. It can be on plants. It can be on tree trunks. That type of thing. They're going to be dormant through the winter. 
The uh, eggs are going to hatch probably in uh, mid-May or so, and the nymphal stage will come out. It's quite small, and then the adults you'll begin to see probably in August, and the adults are uh, as as folks have have seen, very very colorful, and and one of the things that's really kind of interesting about this is that um, because this is such a unique insect, and there are not all that many lookalikes uh, in as far as native insects are concerned, when people report this to us, it's about ninety percent of the reports are accurate, and with some of our other citizen reporting, um, the accuracy level on those is a little bit lower. Um, so this, uh, from day one, we recognized as a really good one as far as public outreach and engaging the general public and helping us with survey and reporting this. Yeah, that's great. It definitely is very noticeable with those those red coloration on the wings. Uh, we can circle back with additional questions near the end of our program. But thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. In our next segment, we will hear some of the innovative ways that New York State DEC is tackling invasive species across the state. They are using cutting edge technology, keen observation skills, and getting a little help from our four-legged friends. Once an invasive species has been here and becomes established, it's really hard to get rid of. And so when we're thinking about being strategic, we think about things in the terms of this invasive species curve, where at the, the top end of the curve, that's when a species has been here, it's established, its population numbers are really high, and there's really no way to get rid of it completely. Really what we want to be doing is we want to be focusing on those bottom parts of the curve, where you know those populations are really low, where we're detecting things early, you know, have that good return on investment where we find something, we're able to stamp it out before it becomes established and becomes a big problem. When it comes to detecting invasive species early, sometimes it helps to get creative. And it never hurts to enlist a little help from a friend. working with Dia, our conservation detection dog, and uh, Josh, our handler, uh, looking for scotch broom. Scotch broom is a tier two uh, invasive species in the lower Hudson, which means that it's emerging uh, as an invader. It's not yet widespread. It's at low enough numbers that we actually have a chance of eradicating it. And Dia is one component of that effort to eradicate scotch broom in the lower Hudson. They're in among other plants. It's harder for the humans to find visually. We use visual cues, and when it's among other plants, it's hard to find it. Um, but the dogs can actually use a scent cue. Um, we think we'll be able to progress a lot faster with the dog because she'll be finding plants when they're smaller, and we won't have to wait another year or two years before humans would be able to see those plants. You know, what we see is that the dog is coming into what we call scent cones and you could probably see from watching her she'll be searching and then you'll just kind of see this this change in in the position of her body or her head will jerk and go back and you'll see she kind of just has her nose down she's sniffing around because the scent can get caught in little pockets in the grass or other trees and then she's going and she can smell it but she's trying to find basically the source of it right and so in certain circumstances there were a couple of plants together so you see she's going, oh, this one, this one, this one, and this one is the one I'm going to indicate on. This is where the most scent is coming from. 10, 20 years ago, who would have thought that we'd have drones that we might be able to use for this kind of work? Yes, we knew that dogs could do search work, but who would have thought that we could have gone here? I don't think we can predict what we're going to have next, um, but I think we're always going to have invasive species especially with a global world and if we want to protect our native habitats we're going to have to have tools and mechanisms that allow us to do that.
by using dogs, we're bringing awareness to this issue because, you know, people really, really love dogs. And so they see, oh, she's doing this. Well, what, what's she doing? She's looking for invasives? Oh, well, what are invasives? So it's also a good way for us to educate the public about what's going on and why this is an issue. And if we can attach the face of a dog to the program, that helps you know, pick people's interests. There's nothing more than she loves than just running and smelling stuff. So I just feel like this is the perfect job for her. Unlike Dia, Brent Kainal and his invasive species prevention team cannot rely on their sense of smell. So they have to use a different method. We're going to be surveying for southern pine beetle. So the southern pine beetle was first detected in this area in September of 2014. We began aerial surveys in December of 2014 and we conduct these surveys about four times a year. Then you guys do the on-the-ground on the management for that. So your job today will be a photographer. Um, I'll be sketching um, polygons of new infestations, if we see any, and um, I'll just let you know what side of the plane to be taking pictures out of as we, as we fly. We'll probably fly for about two hours. One of the telltale signs of a southern pine beetle infestation are the red tops of trees in the pine barrens which is what the team is keeping an eye out for today. Oh, in the South Fork and then the Central Pine Barrens region of uh, Long Island. So basically I'm just taking pictures of the landscape and eventually if there's anything, any like red top trees, and later on I'll go down and survey the area by ground so that I could uh, identify how many, exactly how many trees there are and how much we have to cut. And then I have a uh, tablet with uh, aerial photograph on it, and I, I also have polygons of previous um, recordings from our aerial surveys, so I can uh, see if there's any new infestations of the uh, solar pine beetle out here. There are so many tools available to us to slow the spread of invasive species. That was really interesting to see how drones, planes, and dogs are used in conservation efforts. I'd like to welcome the director and producer of this film, Steve Powers, and I would like to welcome Forest Health Diagnostic Lab Coordinator, Jessica Cancellari. Welcome. Thank you. Steve, tell us how you filmed this segment with the with the conservation dogs. You know, was it was it difficult to do? The uh, hardest part of the entire uh, process of making this documentary was ending up uh, not featuring the dog for the entire hour. Our first cut was, uh, we had an extra about five minutes in there that we had to cut out because um, we just loved it so much. And if there's one thing you learn pretty early on uh, is if you want to pique an audience interest, just add a dog and you're pretty much covered. Um, so it was great. It was one of the interesting things was just how much fun it was for, the, for Dia. Um, they spend most of the time just playing and it was at the beginning of the program and they're really just trying to kind of get her to enjoy the process and just try out the different techniques and just and just watching her go. She was just having a great time. So it was it was nice to see um, such a unique uh, idea on kind of stopping in detecting plants. Yeah, that it really was. I wasn't even aware that that was something that uh, was being done. Um, so, Steve, what was it about working with the conservation dog, Dia, and her, and her handler that really stood out to you? Um, I think just the uh, the idea that it, when we first started, it was just such a, the de early detection phase is such a sweeping issue that there's like no, there's no cookie cutter way to do it. You have to cover so many different bases and it's kind of a daunting process to uh, look everywhere and be uh, vigilant at all times for all different types of species that react different ways and come in different ways. Um, so just seeing the uh, the creativity and the focus of just like let's use these dogs that have been used for you know dogs have been used for uh, sniffing drugs and uh, bombs and other things. So re retooling that idea to attack invasive species I thought was very interesting and just the idea that um, the the issue is so wide ranging that you have the 
micro view of it where you have a dog literally sniffing out scent cones of one individual plant and then you go much wider and you have them going aerial surveys all over um, the Pine Barrens in Long Island. It's just such a, there's just no one way to do it. And it's, it was very impressive to see how, how much action they're taking and just there's no bad ideas when it comes to detection. It's such an important issue. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, Jessica, they talked about tier two invasive species in this uh, segment. Um, how dangerous is a tier two? What does that mean? A tier two invasive species is one that's here and somewhat established, but is not widely distributed. And so we consider it potentially still eradicatable. Um, so Linda Rolliter had mentioned specifically uh, Scotch broom, I think, as the tier two species, um, meaning that early detection is even more crucial at that point because we still have a chance to do something about it. Jessica, what other uh, new technology is being used in invasive um, species management? There's so much technology. I mean, the invasive species community is the most creative community I've ever worked with. Um, so of course we have the detector dogs and we have the aerial surveys, but um, you know, one thing our lab actually works on is new methods of early detection. We like to collaborate with the scientific community to come up with new and creative ways to find things. So. You know, eDNA is really big these days, environmental DNA. Uh, it's been used for aquatic invasive species and for uh, aquatic endangered species for uh, a while already, maybe 10 to 15 years. But it's used for terrestrial invasive species such as spotted lanternfly or terrestrial plants or emerald ash borer is, is really very new. And so currently the DEC is working with uh, a whole suite of other agencies that are trying to develop this technology and essentially eDNA is the DNA that an organism leaves behind after it's moved through an environment. And we can capture that um, in a few different ways and um, extract it and test it in a molecular lab and figure out exactly what's there. And you can look for spe uh, specific species or you can find out everything that's in a potential area or that has been in an area. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, you know, I think it's still several years away from real full-scale implementation. Um, another interesting thing we do is uh, we work with the arborist community and the city forester community to collect uh, pruned material. And we sequester that material in emergence barrels and then allow any wood boring insects that might be inside to come out. And um, there was a, a project that happened in Greenwood Cemetery a few years ago in Brooklyn, which is a real hot spot for invasive species. And um, the U.S. Forest Service found a brand new species to science down there infesting European beech that was actually related, the beetle was related to the emerald ash borer. Um, and that beetle ended up having to travel all the way around the world before we figured out what it was. And, and, and then they had to describe a new species. Um, another thing that we do is outreach. And so I love how, you know, Josh Beasy, the dog handler, talks about Dia, and he says that he loves to put um, a, a face to invasive species and such a warm, lovable face, such as a dog. And it's so true, you know, if, if the public isn't invested in this and if they can't feel it on some level, um, then they just might not care. You know, we all have a lot of other priorities we're dealing with. And um, I think it's really important to find ways to connect with the public because, uh, you know, there's a lot more of the public out there than there are of us. And, and we need everyone looking for these things and paying attention. It's like the more eyes in the forest concept, you know? Um, so, for example, in our lab, we also do the Asian longhorn beetle uh, pool survey, where we ask citizen science to monitor their uh, pool filters each summer for the Asian longhorn beetle during the month of August. And we get a lot of participation and people get really excited about it. And they're just really eager to have an opportunity to help. Um, so I, I think Josh's mission is is really great. And um, I did hear on the on the. Uh, the dog website, you know, he's housed in the New Jersey, New York, New Jersey trail conference, and you can go to their website and learn more about Dia and everything that she does. Um, but I did notice that uh, they're looking for strays and that they'll actually consider stray dogs um, to become future conservation dogs. So if anyone out there knows of any strays that need a home. <laughs> That is great. What a, what a great second second life, right? Yeah. <laughs> and having everyone's participation is really crucial in helping to, to combat this. 
Uh, thank you, Jessica and Steve. We will come back to you in just a few more minutes. Invasive species pose a huge threat to New York's beautiful landscapes and unique biodiversity. However, it isn't all doom and gloom. If you own land, visit our local parks. If you boat, hike, hunt, or fish in New York State, you can be on the lookout for invasive species and do your part to help win the fight against invasive pests. So when I first started working uh, for the Heritage Program, I went on one of the trips to help our uh, state botanists look for some of the rare plants that had been growing and had been documented in the, the salt marsh tidal creek systems in the Peconic River area on Long Island. And so I was really excited to be able to see the, these rare plants that had been assessed many years ago. But once we got there, we realized that this site had been completely overgrown by Phragmites. And it was, you know, very heartbreaking to see because we knew that those rare plants that we were there to look for um, really didn't have a chance within this, this big, dense patch of um, the invasive species. It's also been said that, that uh, another word for invasion is, is change. Uh, true enough, ecosystems change a lot. The question is, do they change for the, the better or, or for the worse? When an invasive species comes in, it doesn't only knock out one plant, it typically knocks them all out. If you look at a kudzu invasion, uh, it's this blanket of kudzu and all the plants that used to live there are, are now gone. Same thing with Phragmites, same thing with porcelain berry and autumn olive. Um, they just blanket the area that they invade. So you're not losing one plant species, you're losing pretty much everything that used to, to live there. Uh, nature is, is primarily made up of creatures, plants, and animals that have been interacting with each other for eons. Uh, and they have found the best way to interact is to develop specialized relationships with the plants and animals around them. So most of the creatures out there are, are specialists. What I think is the most important type of specialization is the relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So we can use the, the monarch butterfly as an example. It is a specialist on milkweeds. And it has had to specialize on milkweeds because milkweeds protect themselves. They've got cardiac glycosides and milky latex sap. Those are good repellents to other insects. But over the eons, the, the uh, monarch has developed the physiological ability to, to store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides. And they have behavioral adaptations that allow them to, to avoid contacting the sticky latex sap. So now they can eat milkweeds. But in developing all those specialized adaptations to milkweeds, they have not spent any time developing adaptations to eat the, the tannins that are in oak trees or the cucurbitacins and cucurbits or the nicotine and tobacco and on and on. The monarch butterfly has actually done us a, a huge favor uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so by pretty much disappearing. Uh, because what it's done is point out how important these specialized relationships are. When we take milkweeds out of our landscapes, we lose the monarch. So if you want a world with no butterflies, let's keep doing what we're doing. But if you want a world with butterflies, we've got to have the native plants that support them. Our, our invasive species are not going to do it. Invasive species are here because of us. We're the one that brought this problem. We're the one that have carried them either on purpose or by accident from one country to another and introduced them into a new place where they were able to flourish and take over and cause us all kinds of economic, environmental, and health problems. Um, but we're also part of the solution. We understand how they're getting here, and we need to take real action to prevent more from coming in. I know it seems like we have a lot now, but there's a lot more species that could be introduced if we don't act now and stop them from coming in. You know, one of the issues we have is that we humans have stopped thinking of ourselves as part of the natural world. We're something separate, and we've fallen into the trap of thinking we don't need the natural world. Uh, well, in fact, we are very much a part of the natural world. We're a product of it, and we need it every single day. You may live in a city, but your clean water, your air, your food, your moderate weather systems, all of these things are produced by functioning ecosystems that all do better when they have a lot of species in them, and they all do more poorly when we, we take those species away. And that's what invasive plants are doing. They're reducing the number of species in our local ecosystems. Uh, again, in, in so many cases, uh, it's not necessary. We don't have to buy a plant from Asia that's going to become invasive and reduce our ecosystem productivity. The, the costs are enormous 
um, and the benefits uh, are, are comparatively few. So right now it's all short term, just uh, kill the bugs as they land on your plant. My feeling is I'm going to replant and I think I can control the, the situation um, and then I'll be ahead of everybody else when um, they got the answer to the problem, so if they get the answer to the problem. So I grew up in the Midwest, in Ohio, and that's one of the, the early states that had the emerald ash borer, which first uh, popped up in Michigan. And so my, my parents still live at our, the same home that I grew up in, and we always had amazing trees all through the backyard. Uh, but over the last few years, my dad has been one by one having to cut down and remove all of our ash trees because the emerald ash borer has been killing those off. So for me, I just, I, I, I have a really hard time imagining what New York would be like without the hemlock trees. I think with forest and insect pests in general, it's, it's, we, it's like you don't know what you got till it's gone. And if you just go out in the woods and, and you don't really notice the hemlocks, I think now you need to sort of like think about that. Look over your shoulder and think, oh, this is a hemlock tree. What would it be like if it was gone? Uh, I, I think that it would be astounding uh, to most people. And I do that all the time. I don't live at the Ponderosa, but this year, like I said, I used to have a back lawn back here. When I first bought this property, it was bad. There was tree, you know, we chopped down the trees and like that so I could make a lawn. And I kept it down for the longest time. This year I said, no more. I'm gonna see how bad it gets. And it got bad. All of the life that we know about in the universe and probably all the complex life that is out there occurs in a thin little film called the biosphere on the surface of the earth. And we've chopped up that biosphere and said, you know, Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, and Mary owns, owns this. Okay, that's done, but along with that ownership comes the responsibility of maintaining all of the life in the universe. That's, a, that's an awesome responsibility. We've had a heavy hand in, in all of our ecosystems, so now we have to manage them so that they stay in balance, so that they remain productive. I think we can do that. Um, 80, 86 percent of the U.S. is privately owned east of the Mississippi. So you don't have to think about invasive species problems everywhere. Just think about the invasive problems on your property. If everybody controlled them on, on their own property, we'd be 86 percent done. Um, so that's a much more manageable goal, and I think every, everybody does have the responsibility of, of addressing that. While we struggle across the state with invasive species, there are things that we can do to help. Jessica, um, I'm outside, I find an insect, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's invasive, maybe it's not. What do I do? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Thank God. Um, this is a great question for me, obviously, because I manage the Forest Health Diagnostic Lab um, and we offer free diagnostic services to the public. So we want your insects and your plants and um, we want to ID it for you. So you can, there's a lot of ways to get a hold of us. You can email us at foresthealth at dec.ny.gov. You can simply Google DEC Forest Health Forest Health Diagnostic Lab, and we'll come up. Um, you can send us samples in the mail. You can send us photographs, um, and we will help you figure out what it is. Uh, we also diagnose uh, tree diseases. So if your trees are dying and you don't know why, it could be insect-related, it could be disease-related, it could be invasive, it could be native, who knows? Um, but we will help you resolve that. Um, there's also a huge framework for invasive species support in New York State. So if not us, call your local PRISM, uh, New York is set up, it's broken up into different regions um, for invasive, invasive species management. Uh, so you can just Google um, local PRISM, or uh, just stands for Partnerships in Regional Invasive Species Management. And they work on a more local level and they can assist you as well. And if they don't know what something is, they'll pass it on to us. Um, 
Also, I notice uh, local soil and water conservation districts can be really good resources as well um, for the public. But, and then of course there's the species specific websites like Chris Logue mentioned earlier, Spotted Lanternfly is conspicuous and easy to identify. We have a website for that. Uh, APHIS has a website for Asian longhorn beetle. So if it is one of those conspicuous insects and you know what it is, you can Google it and find the right person pretty easily. But everything unknown, uh, send to us or contact your local PRISM. Thank you. And the, the organizations that you mentioned, I think the links are being put into the chat right now to help you identify those different critters that you're finding out there. Uh, Steve, this was a really uh, complex and interesting um, documentary to put together. What were some of the personal stories that really stuck with you through filming? I think the last one that you saw in that clip uh, with the homeowner, uh, Bill, uh, one of the things we thought would be the biggest issue with uh, this documentary, the biggest goal is to get people to care. But uh, we found out while we were shooting that that wasn't always the issue. Uh, we thought it would be apathy, but it was really just recognition. That was a uh, instance. The reason that we have that interview is because we were filming not we down the road and uh, Bill actually just walked down the street and saw us filming and then started asking us what we were doing. And um, we said, we're filming not weed. And then we showed him what it looked like. And he said, oh, I have that in my yard. And then we ran back to his house and he showed us this personal battle that he's been waging for years. And he had no idea what it was. Um, and he identified it as a problem, but he didn't know what to do about it. And unfortunately, he was doing by actually trying to fix the problem. He was making it way worse because he was mowing back the not weed and each fragment that a mow that gets mowed or ripped off of a knotweed can become its own plant. So he was really uh, exacerbating the problem way more than he would have if he had just left it. But it was just a kind of shows you that it's not always people um, not caring, but it's more just he didn't know what to do. And once he knew what it was and he saw people out there, he, was, he could actually take action and learn that how to actually get rid of it and who to contact. That's, that's really great to be able to help share that information because he was trying to be active about that. Um, Steve, what were some of the challenges of producing this documentary? I think the number one thing was just, just how much information and how much, uh, how much ground you want to cover. It's such a big issue and uh, we, we could have made 10 documentaries or a whole seasons of a docu-series about this problem just in New York and just in certain areas, but there's just such a wide ranging issue um, and it's so individualized and uh, local localized. So there's just different problems in different areas of New York and the prism system really helps kind of uh, personalize those uh, fights and uh, detection to the area that they're in. But just realizing what, what we can show and just um, one of the things that we realized when we were researching is just uh, once you kind of identify these plants, you start seeing them everywhere. So like I've been seeing knotweed and phagmites my whole life, but I've never really thought about it. it was just never recognizing them. Um, so once you kind of break that glass and show people what it are, what they are, you start noticing it. Oh, that's, I noticed it down at my neighbor's house and you just start, start seeing these different things. So just kind of introducing as many invasive species and different issues um, as possible in the documentary and then use that as a jumping off point for viewers to research and find things that resonate with them. Yeah, that's so that's so important. Just knowing is, is more than half the battle. Thank you. Chris, how much of a threat is the spotted lanternfly to maples and other of our dominant forest trees in New York? So good question. Thanks for that. So so we don't think that uh, that spotted lanternfly probably poses a great risk to forest trees may be able to feed on some of our forest trees. The bigger issue um, outside of uh, the grape production and some of the other fruit production is that in very, very large numbers, they create a lot of honeydew, which is the excrement from the insect. It's just a sugary substance that gets on the leaves of other plants. And uh, on that, you can also get something called sooty mold. So there, there, you know, there are outdoor recreational issues associated with the presence of spotted lanternfly. Um, potentially, if you have reduced photosynthesis from the um, uh, 
from the honeydew and the sooty mold. You might have uh, reductions in fall color, uh, perhaps reductions in, in how well some of the, the trees grow. But, but certainly the, you know, the impacts on tourism, the impacts on um, outdoor recreation and people's ability to enjoy their property are all things that have been reported out of uh, areas in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and just a real frustration for the general public uh, on a nuisance basis, as well as the issues around around grapes. Thank you very much. Um, Jess, we have a question for you. Can you speak a little bit about the Asian jumping worms? Sure. Um, there's a small team of researchers working on the Asian jumping worms, and they have a lot of work ahead of them. Um, it's been you know, they've been documented throughout New York State at this point. We know that they're basically everywhere and they're working with uh, the European jumping worms and causing a lot of damage. Um, some people think that Asian jumping worms are perhaps more damaging than European earthworms, but um, in fact, they're not. And for those of you that don't know, uh, we don't really have any earthworms that are native to New York because during the last glaciation, uh, all, th all earthworms basically became extinct from this region. Um, and then some of them very slowly started colonizing again, ones that that uh, survived to the south, you know, kind of started moving up here very slowly again. So we do have a, a few native species that are starting to come into this area. But, you know, all the earthworms generally that you see are non-native and invasive. They're harmful to the environment. So in the case of jumping worms, you know, they just eat the leaf litter layer, you know, on top of the soil and they just eat and eat and eat and they don't stop. And what sort of happens is the top layer of soil, the, the top few layers of soil become homogenized. And it goes from being, um, you know, three, you know, two or three separate layers to just to one layer. And that really, um, it, it changes the way plants can grow. You know, it, uh, especially seedlings and saplings are very susceptible to this. And oftentimes it just downright kills them or slows their growth dramatically. Um, and they think there's a big role with jumping worm activity and uh, mycorrhizal fungi uh, on tree on the roots of trees and other plants, which are uh, symbiotic and beneficial. And um, they're moving around really easily on, you know, especially in the horticultural industry on potted plants and trees that we buy from nurseries. And so if you have it on your property already, there's really, not a lot of control options at this point. Um, but if you don't have it, you have a lot of power in preventing it from coming to your house. And I would say it is well worth the time and effort to try to do so. So try to buy as much bare root nursery stock as you can. If you want to buy a tree or a bush, try to buy the bare root type. Or if you're bringing mulch into your backyard, you know, at the beginning of gardening season, um, I've heard that if you solarize it first, that'll kill any potential worms. So you just cover it with a tarp for like three or four days and leave it out in the sun and it should do the trick. And there's some information online, you know, you can just Google jumping worm and some of these um, preventative strategies are out there. And I'd say that's really your best bet because if you already have it, you have a pretty big problem on your hands already. Thank you. And we have that link that is going to be going into uh, the chat. We've had lots of great uh, questions coming in. Um, I have one more um, on the spotted lanternfly that I'm going to ask Chris. What recommendation, rec recommendations do you have for homeowners that already have um, spotted lanternflies? How can they help to reduce those populations? So good question. So a couple different things, um, you know, removal of the egg masses is really, really uh, one way to reduce the populations. And I think particularly can be effective early on uh, as the population builds. So if you find those egg masses out on uh, trees or other places, you can scrape them off. There's also a, uh, there's also a, um, a particular kind of a soybean oil. Uh, so a vegetable oil that can be used to smother the eggs that has to be used when the temperatures are above 40 degrees. And then during the growing season, when, when the, uh, when the population of nymphs or, or adults are out, uh, there are some uh, other treatments that one can use on, on various types of uh, plants to reduce the populations and a good place to get good and good treatment information 
uh, for spotted lanternfly is the New York State IPM program or the local Cornell Cooperative Extension in your county. They can help with, with advising on how to use uh, those types of products safely. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've had a lot of wonderful questions coming in tonight. Thank you so much for, for asking those. We will continue to put some of the answers up uh, on our social media platforms to, to answer the ones that we didn't get to tonight. I would like to thank all of our panelists this evening, Steve Powers, director and producer of Uninvited, the spread of invasive species with Westfield Production Company. Jessica Cancellari is a research scientist with the DEC Forest Health Program in the Bureau of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Chris Logue is the state plant regulatory official with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. And Rob Davies was the New York State Forester. You can watch the entire documentary, Uninvited, The Spread of Invasive Species, online at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's YouTube page. The link is in the chat. This event will be archived and available to be viewed on WSKG's YouTube channel, and that is also going into the chat. Thank you to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, WXXI, and WSKG. I'm your host, Nancy Coddington. Thank you for joining us.